From Chicago's Can TV, a look at the week's events is reported in the newspapers, in the blogs and online, and on radio and TV. This is Chicago Newsroom. Well, hi there. Welcome to yet another edition of Chicago Newsroom right here on Can TV. I am Ken Davis, and you know, we still haven't really adjusted to what happened to us on, on Tuesday uh, during the, the election. It doesn't matter what your political persuasion is. It was just a shock to the head, and we still are trying to figure out what the heck happened. So I got this idea. I thought, hey, why don't we talk to somebody who was a you know, kind of a liberal, progressive office holder, like maybe a governor in a big state, who got run against by a billionaire who really had no, not really, who had no government experience whatsoever and whose, um, whose mantra was, vote for me and I'll fix everything because I know how to fix stuff because I'm a big guy who owns a lot of property and businesses and stuff like that. Wouldn't that be interesting to talk to somebody who that happened to just a couple of years ago? Well, Pat <laughs> Quinn, welcome. Okay, welcome to Chicago Newsroom. Yeah. So you must have had some really deep sense of empathy for Hillary Clinton the morning after when she was out walking her dog. Yeah, it was no fun. Uh, you know, it's easier winning than losing. Uh, one day you're a peacock, the next day a feather duster, <laughs> you know. Uh, but uh, life goes on. Yeah. You know, you got to yeah. find another hill to climb. And right. Last night, I think uh, Hillary spoke to the uh, Children Defense Fund. Yeah. She once worked for them, a uh, very good group. And, you know, she, she's going to find causes to really get involved in. And she mm -hmm. has tremendous empathy and energy and intellect. And I, I, I know she'll do well. Do you think she's going to stay in the game? I mean, I, I don't mean like run for president again, obviously uh -huh. not. But, I mean, do you think she'll, she'll stay public and visible? I think she'll take positions on important issues, and yeah. I think she should do that. She, uh, you know, believes in things. Mm -hmm. And you have to have folks in public life who are uh, believers in causes and get behind those causes. Yeah, uh, yeah. I think she'll devote probably the rest of her life to helping uh, families and children, yeah. and that's really the closest thing to her heart. You know, I, di I didn't intend to get into any of this, but now we're talking about this. Tell me a little bit about that. Tell me what it was, what it was like in that couple of weeks afterward. I mean, you, you, you're going from just yeah. being in this insane world of everything, you know, down to the second. What well, campaigns like? are tough. You know, they're very uh, intense and stressful and pressure-packed. Uh, election Day comes if you get a verdict, yes mm -hmm. or no. Uh, but, you know, I was still governor for right. two months, right. and uh, I felt we needed to do as many things as possible uh, during those last couple of months. And I worked a lot on clemencies uh, yeah. of uh, all the governors that came before me and I imagine mm -hmm. after me. We probably did more clemency cases, uh, looking yeah. at each of the files, the petitions, and uh, I tried to do the best I could on that and right up to the last minute uh, on noon of the last day where the next person took office, I really didn't go down to Springfield uh, for that because I was still working on cases where people were petitioning for uh, justice. And there was one case, uh, Tyrone Hood, uh, who was in prison down in Menard Prison in Southern Illinois for 22 years for a murder he did not commit. And I looked at the file, I got it towards the end actually, they petitioned me, and I uh, was able to uh, commute a sentence and he was able to get out of jail um, and uh, it's sad because the person who perpetrated the crimes they, uh, went on to commit two more murders and uh, an innocent man had been sent to jail, wrongful mm -hmm. conviction, and it, it certainly sensitized me to the importance of criminal justice reform and that's something we have to keep working on in our mm -hmm. state and our country. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what we're going to talk about today, too. I mean, I see you've got your petition clipboard with you. You yes. go nowhere without right your here. petition here clipboard. Right? <laughs> yeah, right. yeah, petitions it, are us. <laughs> yeah. So, but, uh, but before we get off onto that, let's just, let's just spend a moment up here in the clouds because I, I, I'm really interested to hear what you have to say about this. What's your, what's your sense of America after, after Donald Trump? I mean... What was your gut feeling, or what is? Are they still developing? What, what do you well, think? It was a close election. The candidate who got the most votes in America was right. Hillary Clinton, and she might get right now. It's about a million three. Uh, mm -hmm. It might go up two million Could more votes. Two, yeah, yeah. So I do think we need to reform the 
Electoral College, a creature of the 18th century. I don't think it's really apropos to the 21st century. And there's a movement that uh, I've supported. It's called the National Popular Vote. Mm -hmm. And Illinois actually passed a law about 2008 uh, that said uh, once 25 states, more than half the states, uh, have a uh, law on their books that says that uh, their Electoral College members are bound by law to vote for the candidate for president who gets the most votes, uh, then uh, that will be the law of our country. You don't this need is, a constitutional amendment. This is big news to me. I was not aware that Illinois was one of them. Oh, yeah. I, I didn't know Illinois yeah. was on that list. New York, California, Illinois have already signed on to uh -huh. this law. Yeah. And uh, we have to get more states. I think it's up to about 12 or 13 states. Yeah, I read but, it as 12, I think. Yeah. 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 So, you know, a little more work to do. But we, we shouldn't have be imprisoned by this system because in this century, the 21st century, We've had two candidates mm -hmm. uh, who have not been elected president by mm -hmm. the Electoral College, but they did get more votes than the other candidate mm -hmm. for president, any now, other candidate. Now tell me that if Hillary Clinton had won the Electoral College and Donald Trump got two million more votes that you'd still be out here banging the drum No, I them. believe in the cause. I already signed on to it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, the last time it occurred before the year 2000 in Al Gore, was in 1888. Uh -huh. So for a hundred and some odd years, yeah. it really wasn't a factor. But the way the demography of our country is now, That's it. Uh, we're really kind of being unfair right. uh, to people who maybe live in more urban areas uh, mm -hmm. like ours, right. the metro of Chicago. And, um, you know, every vote should count equally. Yeah. It shouldn't uh, be more votes for a particular region. It's really interesting you say that because it seems so fair to say every state should have its own say and the less populous state should be equal to California, New York, and Illinois. But you know what? I'm not believing that anymore. I'm really not. And I don't think it has anything to do with this last election. I was feeling this before yeah. that I'm tired of being lectured to about the family farmers in Montana or whatever it is, or the ranchers in Montana, mm -hmm. and that they have as much say well, I would say disproportionate, say, to, to 100,000 people who live in a big city somewhere. Yeah, it should be equal. I actually had an uncle, great uncle, who had a ranch in Montana, mm -hmm. and uh, he was a good Democrat. Uh, in Montana, elected a Democratic governor again. But uh, having said that, I think every vote should count. Mm -hmm. Every person should count. And that's what we have for uh, reapportionment and so on for legislative seats and congressional seats. Right. Yeah. Uh, and it's important for president that we not use a harbinger of the 18th century. Yeah. Actually, yeah. it was devised to help the slave states, mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. the Electoral College. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we should maintain that. And that's something we can learn from this election. We're mm -hmm. not going to change the results. And, unfortunately. Uh, but I think for the future, it turns out Trump himself was for uh, uh, abandoning right. the Electoral College. I don't and going count that to, for much of anything. He's, he's for well, anything until he's not. Until yeah, he's not but I mean, it. if he said it before, it's <laughs> yeah. a little hard for him to go running around saying it's, uh, uh, it, it no, ought it's to be not. changed. <laughs> yeah, right. No, it's right. not. He can, he can change his opinion. Truth is, uh, is not relative. <laughs> yeah, you the, can't have your own set of facts. Right, you right. can have your own opinions, yeah, but yeah, there yeah, ought to be one yeah, set of facts. Yeah. So could we talk a little bit about uh, the Illinois election? Because I printed out some documents mm -hmm. here today. Let's see. Uh, the, um, the, the Senate has gone from uh, 39 Democrats to 37, down a total of two. Mm -hmm. The Illinois House of Representatives has gone down from 71 to 67 Democrats, so that's four. Mm -hmm. Do you care? Oh, of course. I think those are strong majorities for the Democratic Party. And uh, the members, both House and Senate members of the Democratic Party in Illinois who are elected to the legislature, I think are by and large very progressive people and uh, want to do things and want to make things happen. When I was governor, I worked quite a bit with each member. A lot of times they have individual issues that they're concerned about. But we were able to put together an infrastructure bill for our state. We called it Illinois Jobs Now. $31 billion investment mm -hmm. in roads and bridges and water systems, building new uh, buildings, college buildings, as well as uh, school construction and many uh, high-speed rail. Great things. We had the biggest infrastructure program of any state in the country, and those members made it possible. And uh, they wanted to do things. And the sad thing now is uh, my successor, uh, basically when you look at it, uh, what has happened in the last two years other than gridlock and uh, lots of alibis, but uh, 
we, you're not getting anything done for the people. And mm -hmm. government is all about we the people, not for the office holders. When I said, do you care about the, the loss of those seats, I think what I'm, what I'm getting at is that I have a lot of friends who live in Wisconsin. And um, when Walker got elected, they all said, ah, it's, a, it's a hiccup. It won't last. Uh, you know, they have recall. We'll recall them. It'll be over in mm -hmm. two years. The recall was a spectacular failure. And over the last number of years, uh, his government has only gotten stronger and stronger. And it now appears to be a dominant majority in Wisconsin. And, well, I don't know and, about that. Well, okay, but let me finish my premise here. Wisconsin and, and Illinois are very similar, at least in, when you look at, uh, you know, the map. Uh, we, we always talk about how Illinois is basically a red state with a couple of blue islands in it, right? And, and you would know more about this than sure. anybody. But Wisconsin is kind of the same way. And once you, once you begin to um, persuade the people in the blue areas that they're not so important, that, that we really are the people who run this state, and you get a you get a charismatic or I don't know if I'd call him charismatic, but let's say anyway a forceful governor and and uh, anyway what I'm asking you is are we going the way of Wisconsin? No. Could you, can you no. Could you see ten years from now that we're going to no. be a majority Republican state? No, no, no. Why? Not not even close. Uh, look at the election results of the last election. The candidates for statewide office, Susanna Mendoza, mm -hmm. won convincingly against uh, Rauner's hand-picked uh, person for comptroller, uh, and, and Tammy Duckworth, who I met, uh, she was uh, wounded in Iraq, and I was at Walter Reed Hospital, and that's where I first met her, and uh, I've known her for a very long time. She ran a great race for U.S. Senate, and soundly beat Kirk, and Hillary Clinton uh, almost beat uh, Trump by almost a million votes in our state. In fact, I think we're much more uh, the model for the United States. Illinois' demography, the people who make up our country, are the best reflection of the entire population of the United States. So we're much more like the United States than any other state in the Midwest even, let alone the whole country. So, you know, I think what we have to do is put together a progressive majority for important reforms. I do think we have to take into account that there are billionaires out there, mm -hmm. really right-wing conservative billionaires, who want to buy elections, and they'll spend un untold amounts of money. Uh, oftentimes they can perhaps uh, prevail when they have a candidate who has no record. But when that candidate gets elected, whether it's Trump or Rauner, and then you see the lack of a record, mm -hmm. you know, what have they done other than harm things and mess things up, then I don't think they're going to do very well in getting reelected. Uh, so I think it's important to have a movement. Uh, the movements don't start at the top. They bubble up from the grassroots. That's what I believe. The great changes of our country, civil rights, uh, environmental movement, the consumer movement, all of them have bubbled up from grassroots citizens banding together for causes they believe in. And that's how we're going to change our state and our country. With, whether it's Rauner as governor or Trump as president, we're still going to be passing petitions, gathering signatures. In my case, I believe in putting binding referendums on the ballot to give people a voice and to make changes. Uh, this past election in our country, four different states had binding referendums to raise the minimum wage in their state. They all passed overwhelmingly. The soda and, taxes, the same kind of thing. Well, mm -hmm. yeah, that's a different one, yeah. issue, but raising the yeah. minimum wage <clears throat> goes right at the heart of yeah. what Bernie Sanders was talking about mm -hmm. in his campaign. And I think he struck a nerve uh, with a lot of Americans that we've got to really focus on economic issues. Uh, the one time I had a chance to visit with uh, Hillary Clinton during this last campaign, I said the most sensitive nerve in the body is the pocketbook nerve. Mm -hmm. And I really feel that you, running for office, always have to focus on economic issues that help the great majority of people. And I think that's a good way to go. And maybe that wasn't maybe that wasn't uh, what she did as, as effectively as she should have, maybe. Well, everybody will have an opportunity to look at the campaign after it's over. Mm -hmm. Clearly, President Obama has rescued the American economy. I got sworn in as governor <clears throat> excuse me, on the 29th of January of 2009. Seems like a long time yeah, ago, and it yeah, is. Yeah. 
But uh, President Obama was sworn in about eight days before, mm -hmm. or nine days before. The American economy and the I Illinois economy. I forgot that. I forgot that you, your, your service was the exact, almost yeah. the same as his, yeah. But the deal is, if you look, go back to where Illinois was in our nation's economy, people were losing their homes, losing their jobs, losing their hope. Uh, the auto industry, which is a large part of the Illinois economy, we have Ford and Chrysler uh, and all the suppliers, uh, they were in the flat of their back. Mm -hmm. And we had to rescue them. And I worked with President Obama on that. And he will des always get eternal credit and gratitude from the people of America for focusing on those economic issues and rescuing us and putting the American economy back on track. And the Illinois economy, we did that too. Now, you come along with some of these right-wing approaches, if they go back to the same uh, approach that got us in the ditch in the first place, uh, you know, we're going to have to resist that. We can't let Trump or Rauner run down our economy. Well, I, <clears throat> I read a lot <clears throat> of the uh, position papers uh, put out there by Illinois, uh, um, Illinois issues mm -hmm. and Illinois politics and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and what I'm reading is that uh, according to the Illinois Policy's re latest article, wealth flight in Illinois has increased to $20,000. In other words, the people who are leaving Illinois are $20,000 richer than the people who are coming in. You're talking and, about a propaganda group and that by the way, Browner gave a half a million dollars to. And, and by the way, it plays all, the violin every and time. And by the he, way, it all happened because yeah. of your tax increase, that it, it's exactly yeah. parallel to the tax increase in the... Uh, well, let, let, the, let's look at the facts. Okay, they can have their opinion, <laughs> but the bottom line is Illinois has to have enough revenue to pay for its expenditures. Mm -hmm. That's fundamental arithmetic, and I believe in that. That's a fundamental law that all of us ought to adhere to in government. Well, we have Don't now, start getting all sentimental. Well, though. okay, but Rauner comes <laughs> along in a campaign and says, we don't need all this income tax revenue. We should resist that, and that's what he's done. And uh, where are we today? They just had a study that came out yesterday. We're on our way to a $15 billion deficit in this fiscal year. If you continue on the path that Rauner has set us on, we'll have a $47 billion deficit within a few years. This is ridiculous. People uh, can't allow uh, th this kind of upside down economics. That does harm job creation and harms everyday yeah, but, people. Yeah, you but know, you have to, you have to break eggs to make an omelet. I mean, it, it, yeah. the, 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 what well, eggs are you breaking? You have students. I work a lot with students nowadays. And, you know, we have a great program in Illinois. It's been around for half a century. It's called the Monetary Award Program. MAP. Yeah, MAP, mm -hmm. MAP grants. They're scholarships. You can go to a private college or a community college in Illinois or a mm -hmm. public college, a public university. It's a great program. And there's about uh, literally tens of thousands of students who benefit from this. More than half are first in their family to go to college in the first place and more than half are of color these are great people and they want to get a college education they have the ability to do college work the grades and such but they don't have the money so we have a scholarship program to help them realize their dream well Rauner's come along and he's greatly harmed that program greatly harmed higher education and community colleges uh, in general. And so that is not helping the economy. That's the exact opposite. If you want flight, that's what you uh, end up with when you hurt uh, people trying to go to a college or community college. Well, or I, I, I was going to point out that a similar study shows that uh, we are like, I don't know, fourth or fifth in the country for flight of uh, millennials out of our state. Mm -hmm. And that this is a terrible thing. Obviously, I think we can agree on that. It's a horrible thing if that's what's happening. But one would have to ask, well, isn't it possibly because we are pretty much getting out of the, the higher education business in Illinois? I mean, we're pretty much just at the point where we're going to start shutting the lights out at the University of Illinois and name them, Western, Eastern, you know, uh, Chicago State, on and on and on. We're, we're just seeing well, nothing so, but... So I believe in higher education. I invested in higher thing. education. The University of Illinois had a hall that many, many of the students have gone through those doors called Lincoln Hall. Lincoln's son actually was at the dedication of this hall back in 1910. Well, it's fallen apart. When I became governor, that's part of our infrastructure bill. We got the funding. We had to raise some revenue to do it. But $31 billion investment in the infrastructure of Illinois, including rebuilding Lincoln Hall for the 21st century. So those students get 
a place to learn that's relevant to this time. And it seems to me that those who are attacking Illinois, like Rauner, they're always complaining and they have more alibis than, you know, uh, Carter has pills. Uh, you know, why don't you do something? Why don't you help people rather than uh, cause uh, great harm to folks who are vulnerable and who need a helping hand? And so that's really where we're at. And I sure hope we don't let Trump do the same thing to America. And that's why you got to organize. Early to bed, early to rise, work like hell and organize. That's my philosophy. <laughs> and that's why the things that g happened well in the recent election where citizens at local levels, at state and local levels, were using petition to put binding referendums on the ballot, uh, like we're trying to do here in Chicago, uh, coming up for the next election, that's where citizen power really comes into play, mm -hmm. Ken. The everyday people can help make a law and move our country and our state and our city forward. I, I, I don't want to get off for a moment of this, this sort of slow-moving atrocity of higher education, not only in Illinois, but in the nation. I mean, I, I, as far as I know, uh, funding nationally for higher education is down 40% since 1980. We're eating the seed corn. I mean, th this well. is, when you think about our parents mm -hmm. and the GI Bill, and right. and what that did for this country and this everybody likes to pay lip service to education education is so important and then when we get down to it we cut we cut we cut and i would like to have you address the fact that i believe the last time i looked illinois is still good old number 50 when it comes to funding education well once you talk about higher education which you just were talking there are two about th i know there are when two when i different was governor i can't help it my I'm last just... budget i proposed doubling the amount of money that our state invested in these map scholarships it was about 375 uh, thousand, uh, million when i was governor i wanted to double it over 5 years to 3 quarters of a billion because scholarships, as Bernie Sanders in his campaign pointed out over and over again, the cost of going to higher education and all those loans and that is a, a real impediment for a lot of families and students. And so we have to do something about it. And there were plans in this campaign, uh, both Bernie and Hillary had plans to make college uh, education, higher education more affordable. Part of it is a state investing in higher education. Exactly. I proposed that. Yeah. I ran against somebody in a campaign in 2014 who said that we didn't need to have the revenue to do that. Mm -hmm. And now he's got a $15 right, billion right. Dollar, uh, deficit. Now I also, in that same budget, proposed uh, investing in uh, K-12, to kindergarten to 12th grade, more than any other time in Illinois history using the revenue that we had from the income tax and other re sources of revenue. Again, the other side said, you know, they demonized that source of revenue. And so we haven't been able to make the investments not only in K-12, to but early childhood education. I wanted to invest a billion and a half new dollars in early childhood, zero to five, birth to five. Very, very important investment for any state to make if it's really concerned about education. Okay, so you wanted to do all those things and the people of Illinois said no. Well, okay, but in that campaign... You had somebody running around just like Trump's with a slogan. And they said they can fix things up, they can shake things up, but then look at the record of the last two years. What has happened? Not much. Not much at all. Matter of fact, where's the budget? I did six budgets when I was governor. Uh, this person has, uh, uh, you know, put all kinds of conditions on a budget. So they don't. Right now they have they have a stopgap. That isn't a budget. That you need something that really brings people together, that makes investments for the future. That's how you grow jobs. That's how you help people. You've got to invest in people, invest in the infrastructure. The two go hand in hand. That's how you have a strong state. When I left, uh, our state was very close to get, getting, paying its bills within a 30-day period, just like businesses do. Uh, but, you know, you come along with a person with a different approach, like they have on Kansas, and they cause a lot of mess. And that's what we have in Illinois. A lot of mess. Austerity. Every, Not, well, the austerity. We've got to save money. We've always got to. We've, uh, well, we. I cut, do less with more with yeah, less. Or I cut five point seven billion dollars out of the budget. It, it was a tough time. We. Mm -hmm. I took office. Yeah, uh, it was rather know, unpopular. During the recession. I recall. Yeah. Mm -hmm. but you had to make some economies that were difficult. 
but you also had to make investments that paid dividends for yeah. years to come. And that's what we have to do in America, and that's what we have to do in our state. We're, we're, I, I, just, just briefly, what, what do you think is going on in Springfield? As we're speaking right now, there are these conferences or lack of conferences going on between the, government, the governor and the four tops. Uh, do you have any optimism about this? Well, I would hope that Rauner would resist trying to break unions and uh, bust unions and have all kinds of uh, proposals and conditions on the budget that are harmful to working people and their wages. He's had that from day one. It's caused a lot of problems because uh, people aren't going to vote for arsenic in the drinking water. And uh, if you're going to have a budget, you've got to have a straightforward budget that allocates revenue for expenditures, but doesn't have a lot of conditions that are not relevant to the spending of a budget in the course of a fiscal year. And that's really the heart of the problem. The other heart is you've got to have enough revenue to equal your expenditures. If Rauner thinks that whatever he uh, campaigned on is sufficient to pay the bills, he's just plain wrong. The record shows that he's uh, in deep, deep deficit and continuing to go deeper. That's not right. And um, I think we need to do something about that. And I think the Democrats should continue to st stand their ground uh, with respect to making sure that we allow working people to organize unions, to have collective bargaining, to bargain for wages and working conditions and so on and, and uh, benefits. And if Rauner wants to break that, he's not going to get away with it. Uh, we're not going to go the way of uh, some other states that have uh, allowed uh, working people to uh, be really hurt by um, attacking their unions. Well, that's I do want to talk about something else, which is I've been bringing this up. And that you're talking about Springfield. This is a petition right here in Chicago. And I've been working on it uh, for the last oh, five or four or five months. This is called Take Charge Chicago. And uh, I live in Chicago. I've lived here, I'm born here and all that. And uh, we're trying to put something on the ballot at the next election. Uh, for people to have some hope and to take on these power brokers. And uh, what this petition is about is term limits on the mayor of Chicago. Every other big city in America has term limits on the mayor, except Chicago. New York has it, Los Angeles, Philadelphia, Houston, San Jose, San Antonio, Phoenix. Chicago is the only city that doesn't have a two-term limit on its mayor. We want to give people a chance to vote on that right here in Chicago. So, yeah, I find this really fascinating, and I, and I really want to spend some time talking to you about this. Why do you think that term limiting the mayor of Chicago would make Chicago a better place to live? What's, what's the reason for that? Same thing as the president said the other day. Two terms. George Washington started it. King George in England. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll save that for our discussion. <laughs> but, uh, you know, term limits on executives, especially mayors and presidents uh, and governors, is a good thing. It, 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 especially now in this age of big money being spent on campaigns, it requires uh, a changeover, a, a new look. We, a lot of the problems Chicago has today is they weren't addressed by mayors who got reelected, but uh, oftentimes it didn't address serious problems. Term limits force you to uh, shuffle the deck and have a new look. And uh, they're very popular with the voters. Uh, they, the beginning of our country believed in rotation of office. If Chicago is Go doing, back to the farm. If Chicago is doing something so great in America, then the other nine big cities would uh, abolish term limits on their mayor. It's the exact opposite. They understand that the mayor should be there for a period of time. And then, uh, in the interest of democracy, step aside and let someone else try. It's a really interesting issue for me because I have been all over the place on it. There are times when I can see that it has value and there are times when I think it's a crazy idea and I've never been able to resolve it in my own mm -hmm. head. Um, I think that, uh, yes, it does reshuffle the deck and the deck should be reshuffled. Rahm Emanuel spent $25 million with a super PAC. Mm -hmm. How can anyone take that on when you have an incumbent in the way uh, politics is done today? Yeah, yeah. You know, it's pretty tough. But it's so intertwined, though, with the gerrymandering issue, right? I mean, aren't no, they almost one and the same no, issue? No, no. 
term limits, especially on executive office holders, whether it's the president, the governor, or the mayor, mm -hmm. uh, that is a way for ordinary citizens to, in our case, we're putting on the ballot a binding referendum that says to the mayor, here are the rules. You have two terms, mm -hmm. two consecutive four-year terms. And after that, step aside. Uh, what happened uh, way back when, when George Washington did it voluntarily, King George in England, who had been on the throne for 59 years, was amazed that there would be anybody who, who would, would step aside. Yeah. And that kind of voluntary stepping aside, which is really what term limits is, they call it rotation of office back at the beginning of our country, uh, it's a, a tradition we need to revive, especially here in Chicago. I, I raise the thing about the gerrymandering, though, because if one party is able to really dominate a uh, whatever it is, the state of the, the country, they can virtually guarantee that the the office will ch the, the the office holder will change, but nothing else will change because all, they will be able to control that office. You no, know, people are different. You know, leaders are different. They're not all the same. And uh, you know, President Obama was asked uh, why he uh, did, didn't you want to run for a third term. He was asked, and he said, "No, it's prohibited by the American Constitution." He also said it's prohibited by a higher authority, <laughs> Michelle Obama. <laughs> right. yeah. And so I think that there was a real insight there that, you know, you put everything you can into being president or mayor mm -hmm. or governor. Mm -hmm. uh, but after a period of time, uh, you know, you've put everything in and you've served eight years. That's enough time to make a difference. And then let uh, another person uh, vie for the office. There's more competition, obviously, yeah. when the incumbent has to step aside. I'm pushing back only mildly at this, but, you know, I, I've, I've asked everybody I can think of, if, uh, if Barack Obama were on the ballot this time, wouldn't he get reelected? Of course he would. He would have been mm -hmm. overwhelmingly reelected. Yeah. And believe me, he would have been fine with it. So, well, uh, Michelle or no Michelle, he would well, have been fine with it. I believe in Pre President Obama, and President Obama, as I said earlier, rescued our economy in America. Mm -hmm and deserves eternal credit for mm -hmm. it. I mean, I don't think he gets enough credit for taking uh, charge as president during a very difficult time. We certainly wouldn't want a third term of George Bush, George W. Bush. But you remember, President Reagan was very, very popular uh, in 1988. If he had run again, he probably would have won. But it wouldn't have been good for our country. And I think there's a, uh, a real insight yeah. into yeah. the fact that two terms is sufficient time to make a difference. Now what we want to do in Chicago is 23 towns already in Illinois have put term limits on the mayor. Places like Springfield and Naperville and Des Plaines and Oak Lawn. So we have a power to have a binding referendum in the biggest city of our state, Chicago. And if people get a chance to vote on it, and the only way you do is we got to get 100,000 signatures. That's a lot of work. You have to talk to a lot of people. But then the people are making the law. They're making the, uh, they're petitioning it onto the ballot, mm -hmm. uh, one signature at a time. And then the people, when they vote after hearing the debate on the issue, they make the law. The mayor can't change it. Mm -hmm. The city council can't change it. That's what we need, Ken, much more in Illinois. Grassroots democracy where people are voting on issues as well as candidates. And that's part of the reason I'm so involved in this. I do believe in the power of voting on issues, uh, whether it's minimum raising the minimum wage or term limits for the mayor of Chicago. There's a lot of good issues that don't get addressed. In a way, this is, this is to me, similar to the debate about the elected school board. The, well, the, I'm a lead plaintiff in a lawsuit to require I know an you elected are. Uh, I know school you are. board in Chicago. And the one side of my brain says, this is, this is a no-brainer. Of course it should be elected. The other side of me says, oh, that's just what I need. I need $5 million being spent on every seat battling out, you know, $100 million being spent well, well, wait, to wait, elect wait, wait, wait. a school board that's not going to be any different than the one we have now. Uh, that's absolutely false. Uh, the appointed school board by the mayor over the last 20 years has made a mess of the uh, school system here in Chicago. They even ended up with a superintendent who's convicted of a felony. You know, come on. Uh, an elected school board is fundamental to democracy. Around uh, our state, every other community has an elected school board. Only Chicago does not allow its citizens uh, to have the voting rights to elect members of the Board of Education. 
In addition, that Board of Education is levying hundreds of millions of dollars in property taxes on those voters, and they have no voting rights. That's not taxation right. Taxation without representation. Yeah. I think I've read that somewhere. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. you know, we have a lawsuit. Our lawyer is Tom Gagan. I, I'm the lead plaintiff. It's mm -hmm. against the Board of Education. And uh, what we want is an elected opportunity uh, for the people of Chicago to elect the members of the school board. I think you know, it'd be 15 members, there'd be 15 districts, and uh, it would be a healthy exercise of democracy. Too often, people in power, uh, and that includes the mayor, they want to appoint people, uh, and the, the appointees are not representative of the community. And I think electing is uh, a pretty good way of getting the community sense on who should uh, have a voice in making sure we have a good school system. I've been on the school, uh, local school council. I was elected by my community, but it's not like running the whole system, uh, which is the Board of Education in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, you know, I'm about 78% in agreement with you on this. The part <laughs> of me that's not in agreement is, is in recession, I will admit. But let's take a look at Rahm Emanuel. Okay, and I'm not talking about Rahm Emanuel, I'm using the Rahm Emanuel example. And I think you could say the same thing for Rich Daly, possibly. And I, I think you could say the same thing for Harold Washington. Harold Washington got elected once and then died, of course. It took Rahm Emanuel an entire term to try to figure out what this job was, in my humble opinion, and to learn that it wasn't as simple as he thought, that he was going to just come in, issue a few edicts, and fix everything. It took him a while to figure that out. And some people might say, I don't know if you would, that, that he's beginning to sort of get hold of the ship a little bit. We're seeing some improvements with the, with the budget. Uh, there are some people who are satisfied with the idea that the, the, the police oversight is being done. I, I'm not here to make an argument for Rahm Emanuel, but what I'm saying is maybe his third term would be his good term. Well, voters will have... And I'm not saying, I'm not, you know, okay. I'm not speaking specifically about him. I'm just yeah. saying that sometimes right, it takes term more than four years. Term limits on mayors, uh, you know, they should not be just personalized to one person. We've tried right. to avoid I understand that, that in this I, campaign. I totally understand It's that. whether or not two terms are enough to make a difference. Right. We want to give voters a chance to vote on that. We call it Take Charge Chicago. Our website is takechargechicago.org. Mm -hmm. And we have to collect 100,000 signatures to put a referendum on the ballot asking voters whether we should have a term limit on the mayor of Chicago. As yeah. I said earlier, yeah. every other big city in America has term limits on their mayor. Not Chicago. Chicago's the exception. Now. New York has this, and that's a big city. Same way with Los Angeles. They're both bigger than our city. Mm -hmm. It's not like Chicago's doing a lot of good things. Too many mistakes mm -hmm. have been made. And I think voters ought to have a chance at the ballot box not to let Rahm Emanuel or any other mayor tell us what the rules are, mm -hmm. but we, the people, set the rules for the mayor. Address the criticism that's been leveled at you that this really <clears throat> is nothing more than just sort of a personal thing of you of getting going after Rahm Emanuel. Yeah. I've been doing referendums and petition drives for 40 years. We did the Citizen I Utility know, I've Board. Seen them. Yeah. yeah, Citizen Utility Board was a referendum. It began on the ballot in Chicago in 1982, and it passed, and that led to a law that created the biggest consumer group in Illinois. It's been around now for a third of a century. I also did a petition drive that reduced the size of the legislature yes, in Illinois, called the Cutback Amendment. Mm -hmm. We did a petition. Uh, to stop legislators from collecting their whole pay, their, all their salary, on the first day of office. Before they did a single day's work, they used to have a practice of collecting their annual salary in advance. We stopped it with a petition, and a, and a, uh, they got a law passed against that. So I believe in this. I believe in grassroots democracy, and I think most people believe in it. We have elites in this state and city, and we have powerful politicians in this state and city who don't want voters to have more voting power. They want to keep the power in their own hands. And what we've got to do is get a crowbar and break open this gridlock and give voters in Illinois the same chance to vote on issues that they have in places like Wisconsin and Missouri and Ohio and Michigan. Right here in the Midwest, voters have a chance at the state and local level to vote on issues through initiative and referendum. We have very limited powers. We have some, but not enough. And that's what the movement's all about. 
We have to let you go. I know uh, we're getting really tight here on your <laughs> time. Um, the Chicago Tribune this morning has a story about Dick Durbin, who has announced that he is uh, no longer even con to be considered uh, as governor of Illinois because he's uh, going to stay in the Senate. He's still number two, and everybody seems to agree that's a good thing. We need him there. So it really has blown a hole open in the Democratic nominee for a governor. I had no intention of asking you about this. I'm not, I'm not even interested in it at this mm -hmm. point. But now all of a sudden your name's back in the newspaper again. Well, are you? I'm going to uh, let the future take care of itself. Uh, right now, I'm interested in petition passing. I understand. Referendums. I understand. Specifically, term limit on the mayor and uh, giving uh, voters a chance to elect a consumer advocate here in Chicago. We have to get 100,000 names to put this on the March ballot in 2018. The deadline is December of next year. Mm -hmm. Anybody listening who wants to help us out, our phone number is 773 999-2016. It's all about volunteers, about everyday people banding together for a cause. And I think uh, that's really what I like organizing uh, and have been doing it for a long time. And we'll see what happens in the future. But you definitely have a sort of an air about you, as somebody who feels that his work is not finished. Well, I have a friend who said when... Uh, I'm in a nursing home someday. I hope not new right, soon, but right. down the road a piece. I got to live to 102 mm -hmm. in order to pay off my kids' college <laughs> loans. Okay, so she, this person said, "You're in a nursing home. You'll be out there passing some kind of petition, <laughs> wheeling okay. around." With I, I, petition. I'll I'll yeah. plead guilty to yeah, that yeah. because that's the voice of the people, and we need more of that. I served as governor. It was an honor to be governor. But what I found is too often powerful politicians of both parties. They really didn't want voters having too much say. Yeah. And so uh, we've got to have in our state the power of initiative and referendum that allows people to, in our state not to just put an advisory question on the ballot about raising the minimum wage. It was on the ballot two years ago, and it passed overwhelmingly. Mm -hmm. uh, we had Rauner, who's against uh, uh, raising the minimum wage to the level we were talking about, and so he's kind of blocking it. Uh, but we could do what they did in other states. You go around the governor, go around the legislature, go directly to the people, and let the people vote on it yeah. and make the law. They're not going to make every law. In fact, initiative and referendum, they're kind of like safety valves. When the process isn't working like it is now, when Illinois can't come up with a budget that's fair to working people and everyday people, uh, then we ought to have a way to go around these uh, politicians. Well, I mean, uh, legalizing marijuana in its various stages is, well, is it was on the a ballot. good example of it something. It was on the ballot in California. Yeah. People heard the debate, mm -hmm. and they voted in favor of, of uh, legalization of recreational right, marijuana. Right. Uh, also, med uh, medical marijuana was right. on the ballot right. in a number of states. Right. But, you know, people can hear the arguments. They get a ballot pamphlet. They can decide. Yeah. And yeah. what's so wrong with that? I think we need more of that in Illinois, particularly, than what we have today, which is, you know, uh, big spending politicians who call each other names. Uh, that's not going to get the job done. So I, I, I really am not going to badger you about this. <laughs> this is not that kind of show. I didn't call you here to say, are you going to run for governor? Are you gonna yeah. run? No, that's not it. But there's a very interesting dynamic that has opened up here right now, and, I, and I'm not talking yeah. specifically about you. There needs to be something happening fairly quickly in, in a fairly short period of time well, if Rauner is going to have a, a, a decent candidate run against him. No, no, the way you get good candidates is what we saw in the presidential election. Uh, you know, there should be a robust primary. Mm -hmm. uh, Bernie Sanders was not taken seriously at the beginning, but he sure was yeah. at the end. Yeah. You know, he put together a campaign based on issues mm -hmm. that he believed in and mil millions of others did. And uh, more power to him. Uh, he, he did a service to our country by not just accepting the sort of the elite's view that you have one candidate and that's enough. Yeah. I think it's healthy to have competition and that's what primaries are all about. I had all these intentions of opening up all these conversations with <laughs> you today about ALEC and what ALEC is doing mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. state legislators, yeah. all, legislators all across <laughs> the country. I wanted to talk to you about AFSCME and, the, and yeah. what's going on with them in the state. What I really wanted to talk to you about was the state of journalism in Illinois. 
because mm -hmm. that's something we're both very interested in. Yeah. And, and it's really interesting. I'm just telling you a very quick story. When I was doing some research for this show, I wanted to look up, um, what was it? I can't even remember what the issue was now. But anyway, I looked up, some, oh, I, I looked up something about ASME and what was the status of ASME. And I saw a story under the Chicago Tribune banner that was actually written in the South Town which is owned by the Tribune, but it was written by Illinois Policy. Yeah. At the bottom, there's a tagline underneath. I'm thinking, yeah. this story seems awfully biased to me. Yeah, there's and, a real this problem. Is, this is what's going on, is that our journalism is being turned over to commercial enterprises. Uh, well, who are, billionaires uh, like Rauner, uh, in my opinion, diabolically, uh, are buying entities and calling them journalism, Calling but they're the really propaganda yeah, operations, yeah, yeah. whether it's a, a radio network, mm -hmm. the Illinois radio network was purchased by these right. uh, propaganda artists, and that's what they're doing, and people have to be careful. Now, we've got to use every means of communication to get the facts to the voters, uh, you know, not propaganda. And I think the voters are perfectly capable of making good decisions based on facts, mm -hmm. but if they're fed misinformation, uh, fiction in many cases, then it makes it difficult to make a good decision. And so we got to take that on. Again, petition, referendum, that vote, voting on issues is a way to go at some of these uh, mm -hmm. entities that are just trying to uh, mislead the public. Uh, you know, they have a lot of slogans, you know, Trump's slogan as well as Rauner's slogan. Uh, but then when you look at the record, look at Illinois in the last two years, what has happened? It's a big mess. And, uh, you know, things haven't gone the way that the uh, candidate talked about, and, you know, people have to make their judgments. We were, we were talking about that exact same thing on the show last week about the power of sloganeering, and that when you can put something like Make America Great Again on a hat, you've got a winning, you've got a winning campaign. Because mm -hmm. it doesn't say anything. There's no content in that, in those four words. Mm -hmm. But everybody who looks at it sees it a different way. And they say, that's what I want. Mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's one of those, it's just something that's as old as the advertising business. I guess. Well, I believe in government of the people and by the people and for the people. That's a pretty good slogan. And Abraham Lincoln said it at Gettysburg on November 19th of 1863. And he said, it shall not perish from this earth. So thank you for having me today. <laughs> I appreciate the opportunity. All right. Always like talking thank to you. you. It's great. I, and I hope we can do it again sometime. I really do. Okay. okay. Fair enough. Pat Quinn was governor of Illinois from um, where? 08 to... Uh, 2009. 20, 2009. 2015. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. Pat Quinn, former governor. Glad to have you here today, and I hope I see you again. I'm Ken Davis. Thanks very much for watching. You can watch this and all of our other shows right here at this address. And we hope you will, and we'll be back next week with our little Thanksgiving, our warm by-the-fireplace Thanksgiving show. <laughs> Thanks, bye.